John chapter number 14. If you're there and you're physically able, let's all stand out of honor and respect for reading of God's Word here this morning. And I want to thank our guests for joining us here. Thank you, your guests, for joining us. And church family, if you see a, fami- uh, a not familiar face here, make sure you make your way over to our guests and make sure that you let them know that you're glad that they're here. So, all right. So John chapter number 14, we're going to begin reading in verse number 15. John 14, verse 15 through verse 23. The Bible says this. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you, yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us? And not unto the world. Jesus answered and said to him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Let's read verse 24. He that loveth me, he that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. The title of this morning's message is this Do we love him? Do we love him? No, the Bible makes it kind of clear to reveal if we really do. Do we love him? All right, so let's have a word of prayer, and then you can be seated, and we'll get into the preaching of God's word here this morning. Father, we come before you, Lord, and Lord, we're so thankful for just who you are. Lord, we're thankful for your mercies. Lord, we're thankful for, Lord, the the gift that you give us, Lord, of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And, And Lord, we're so thankful for that. And Lord, I pray that as we get into the preaching of your word here, Lord, that your people would hear from you, Lord. Father, they, they come not to hear from me. Lord, they come to hear from you. And Lord, it's the power of the word that's going to change the lives of people. So Lord, I, I pray, dear God, that you would just use your word in a great way. We praise you. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> You know, at times I'll say to one of my kids, I, I'll, I'll say to them, I have a daughter and a son. My, my daughter's name is Kyla. Of course, many of you know that. And, and my son's name is Liam. And I would say to them, just kind of just off the cuff, I would say, hey, Kyla, or hey, Liam. And I'll say, guess what? And they'll say, what? And I'll just say, love you. That's it. I'll go to, go to Liam. Hey, guess what? I call him Bub. I say, hey, guess what, Bub? He says, what, Daddy? Love you. I just, just, hey, I think it's important, parents, you should tell your kids you love them. You know, I've read somewhere that that's kind of good to do. You know, tell your kids you love them. I'll just go to, I mean, sometimes I'll say it to them uh, almost to the point where they they, they see it coming. Uh, Just the other day, we're we're coming back into town, uh, and we're in the van, and I just said, hey, guess what? And my son just said, I love you. I said, you got it. (laughs) You got it. They got it. Hey, you know, that's good that I, that I do that, and it's good that we, we should do that as parents, tell our kids that we love them. But the truth of the matter is, if all we do is tell them that we love them, that's not real love. Come on now. If, I, if, if all I ever did for my children was to say that I love you, but I never demonstrated that love, or I never showed that love, or I never acted on love, then listen, then, then that's not real love. Because we all know that love requires action. Love is a verb. Love is something that you do. Uh, you know, I could, uh, I, by doing things, I will demonstrate and show my kids that I love them. Hey, how about this? Not doing things will show that I don't love them. Uh, listen, I mean, it's, it's never been in, in me to smile and laugh when I discipline my children. 
That, 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 that's not in me, okay? Uh, listen, when I have to, when my children disobey and I have to punish them, I have to discipline them, it, it's not a joyful thing for me. Now, listen, I do not enjoy punishing my children. I don't. But listen, if I love them, I will. If I, if I really love them, then I will punish my children when they disobey, uh, when they do wrong. Now, people say, I love Jesus. They say, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Now, it's one thing to say that you love Jesus. It's one thing to have your Facebook post say that you love Jesus. It's one thing to have an I love Jesus bumper sticker on your car that says I love Jesus. But if all that you have is a bumper sticker and all that you have are Facebook posts or social media posts or share this if you love Jesus type of thing. Listen, if that's all that you have, then I hate, sorry to disappoint you, but love is a verb. Love requires action being done. And now this is what Jesus says. Jesus reveals to his disciples, what does it mean to really love him? All right, now look at your Bibles at verse number 15. Have your Bibles open there. Don't take my words for it. Take God's words for it. So verse number 15, this is what Jesus says. If ye love me, keep my commandments. There it is. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Hey, understand what Jesus had just done uh, prior to uh, th this setting right here, prior to this passage. Jesus had already demonstrated what it means for the disciples to love one another. Remember that? I mean, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about how he cleaned, how he cleansed their feet, how he washed their feet. That was a very dirty, disgusting job to do. And Jesus was, was cleaning their feet and he's showing, hey, listen, if you want to be great, then it means that you need to serve one another. That's how they are supposed to demonstrate love between one another. But now Jesus says, if you're going to demonstrate love to me, this is what you must do. Keep my commandments. Listen, Jesus wanted them to know that to love him requires obedience. Did you hear that? To, to love the Lord Jesus will require obedience. Now, the disciples, they were emotionally involved with Jesus. They loved him. They did. But, but listen, being emotionally involved is not the same uh, or will not give the same evidence of love. They were determined to die with him. Remember Peter? Peter said, Lord, I'll die for you. Everybody else might forsake you, but not me. I will die for you. And listen, he was passionate. No doubt he was. But l listen, the evidence that he had wouldn't be based on or wouldn't, wouldn't reveal love for him. Because evidence of love for Jesus requires obedience to Jesus. And the, now listen to this. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Okay. Now we must understand this. Keeping his commandments... On our own is impossible. Keeping his commandments on our own cannot be done. I cannot keep, you cannot keep, the disciples could not keep his commandments just because they willed themselves to do it. They, they were not able to do that. Now, throughout the word of God, there has been many a times where the disciples have tried to do things in their own will. And they fail drastically. How about this? Do you remember the time when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration? Okay. I'm <laughs> just, just waiting <laughs> for answers here. Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, he was with three disciples. There was Jesus and then Peter, James, and John. They're up on the mountain. And the other nine disciples, they're at the bottom. And at the bottom of the mountain, there, there was a man who was, whose son was demon-possessed. And they bring, this man brings his son to the disciples. And let me remind you something. Jesus gave them authority to cast out demons. Jesus gave them that ability to do things. And so when this man brings his son to, G, or to the disciples, they say, hey, well, well, please help me, please help me. And then here's the thing. The disciples were not able to do it. It's like they were ineffective. It's like they were broken. Like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I was just able to do this yesterday. Why can't I do it today? And it's like they're going through each and every disciple. If they, who was able to do it? Who was able to do it? And then Jesus comes down and Jesus cast out this demon from this boy. And the disciples are wondering, Lord, how come we couldn't do it? We just did it. Why were we able to do it? And what did Jesus tell him? He says this, this kind of faith comes by prayer and fasting. What's the idea here? Well, the idea is this. They were trying to do it in their own strength, not based on their relationship with God. 
So as they tried to do, do something in their own will, they failed miserably. Okay, how about this? Peter said, I'll never leave you, Lord. And he tried following the Lord in his own way. Remember that? He tried following the Lord in his own way when, he, when Jesus was arrested. But what ended up happening there? He failed because he denied the Lord Jesus three times. So listen, throughout the entire Word of God, uh, there, there are times, or not throughout the Word of God, but throughout the Gospels, there are times where the disciples, they try to do things on their own, but they fail miserably. Listen, Jesus knew. If they're going to keep my commandments, they can't do it by themselves. Jesus knew if they're going to keep my commandments, they're incapable of keeping his commandments. But here's the thing. Jesus told them, I'm going to go away, and where I'm going, you cannot follow me. Boy, that's encouraging, isn't it? He says, keep my commandments, and by the way, I'm leaving. Oh. <laughs> by the way, I'm leaving. Now listen, Jesus told them, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. But he also understands, Jesus knew it's impossible for them to keep it. So this is what Jesus said he will do. Look at verse number 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Praise God for the words forever. Now, now listen, when we hear the word comforter, your mind will probably go to a couple things. Your bed. <laughs> your comforter. Okay? Or... When we hear the word comforter, maybe describing somebody, we think of someone who consoles someone else. You ever needed someone to console you? Maybe you're going through a hard time. Maybe you're going through difficulties. Maybe you have experienced loss of a loved one, the loss of a spouse maybe. And, and listen, uh, for someone to just be there, that, that's a source of comfort, isn't it? So, so when we think of the word comfort, we think of someone who consoles. We think of someone who comes alongside of. We think of someone who puts their arm around you and says, hey, hey, I'm here for you. If you need me in, if you need me for anything, here I am. That's where our mind comes or kind of goes to when we think of the word comforter. And that word comforter, yes, that is partly true that, that, to come alongside of. But it also means this, to come alongside to assist. Not just to console, but listen. To be a really big help. To assist. And Jesus is saying here, hey, I'm going to send you another comforter. I'm going, to I'm going to send someone, or the Father's going to send someone who is going to come, and there he is going to assist you. He's going to help you. Now listen, for three and a half years, Jesus was their comforter. For three and a half years, Jesus was the one who was always coming alongside them and helping them. For three and a half years, he was. Okay, remember when they were in the storm and Jesus was asleep? And they thought, we're going to die. What are you doing sleeping? They wake him up and say, Lord, don't you care that we perish? And what's the Lord do? He has to get up. He wake, they wake him up from his nap. And he says, peace be still. And listen, whoosh, the storm is calm. Became as glass the sea did. And, and then you know what he did? He came and he had to assist them. He had to come and help them. He had to come and be a comfort to them. Now listen, the Bible also says, he says, that there will be another comforter. Another. Now the word another means this, another of the same kind. Another of the same kind. Well, what do you mean the same kind? Another of the same kind. Well, we got to ask ourselves this question. If Jesus is the first comforter, who is Jesus? We all know the answer to that. Jesus is God. Come on now, don't, don't act like that's news to you. Jesus is God. And so when Jesus is saying, I'm going to send another comforter unto you, he's saying, who I'm going to send is also God. <laughs> well, not a different God, same God. Well, who is this comforter? Look at verse 17. Even the spirit of truth. The comforter is the Holy Spirit of God. That's who the comforter is. Listen, Jesus referred to the spirit as the spirit of truth. Now, why in the world would he refer to the spirit as the spirit of truth? Well, Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Listen, one of the primary roles of the Holy Spirit of God is this, reveal truth. That's one of the primary roles that the Holy Spirit of God has. And what the Holy Spirit of God would do is always reveal truth, will always point to truth, and the person of truth is Jesus Christ our Lord. So the Holy Spirit of God will always put an emphasis 
on Jesus Christ our Lord. Listen, I know that there's other churches that really put a big emphasis on the Spirit. Hey, listen, if you have the Spirit, then you can do this. If you have the Spirit, then you can do that. If you have a big Spirit, you can do this. Hey, hey, listen, the Holy Spirit of God, you read it in the, in the Word of God, the Holy Spirit never draws attention to himself. Never he does. That's another thing. The Holy Spirit's a person, not a thing. The Holy Spirit is a person, and he never draws attention to himself. What does he draw attention to? Better question is, who does he draw attention to? The Lord Jesus. That's who the Holy Spirit draws attention to. Now listen, if, if Jesus is truth, and the Holy Spirit always draws people to truth, according to John 1, 1, the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So listen, if the Spirit reveals truth, and the Spirit points to Jesus, and Jesus is the living Word, we have the written Word, then that means this, the Word of God is truth. <laughs> Did I lose you? I hope not, because I'm getting all confused in my head. <laughs> so this is, this is what the Holy Spirit of God will do. If you want direction from the Holy Spirit of God, this is where he's going to point you. He's not going to point you to your emotions. He's not going to point you to your intellect. He's not going to point you to your feelings. Know where he's going to point you? He's going to point you to truth. This is where the Spirit of God will point you to truth. Jesus told the disciples that the world doesn't know the Spirit. The reason why the world doesn't know the Spirit is because the world doesn't know Jesus. L listen, to reject Jesus Christ, you're also rejecting the Spirit of God. All right, now, second part of verse number 17 there, it says, For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. That is a powerful statement. That is a very, very powerful statement that Jesus just made. Jesus was telling them that the Spirit of God was with them. Listen, that had to do uh, with the fact that, of Jesus' presence being there with them. He said, uh, verse 17, for he dwelleth with you. And then he says this, and shall be in you. Jesus had told them that he was going to go away. For three and a half years, the Spirit of God, was representation of the, the physical body of Jesus being there for three and a half years was with them. But when Jesus dies and resurrects and ascends up into heaven, listen, the Holy Spirit of God's going to come down and not, the Holy Spirit's just not going to be with them. The Holy Spirit will be in them. Okay, let me put it this way. God with them was good. God in them, much better. God with them is good. God in them is great. And listen, Look at verse 19. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live. You know what's amazing? Jesus says, because I live. Jesus knew he was going to die. Jesus knew he was going to go to the cross, but he knew he was also going to resurrect. And because I live, ye shall live also. You know, when Jesus says that the world seeth him no more, that had reference to do with his public ministry. He said, hey, my public ministry is now over, basically. And the world's not going to see me. But you'll see me. Because I live. Now, after the resurrection and ascension of Christ takes place, the Spirit of God will make his way into the hearts of the believers, so they too will have life everlasting. Hey, when the Spirit of God dwells in a person, there's life. He says, because I live, you live. Hey, the resurrection is so key. The resurrection is so important to the gospel message, ladies and gentlemen. It absolutely is. And because Jesus lives, believers by, uh, will live because the Holy Spirit of God dwells within them. Okay, now look at verse number 20. At that day, ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Okay, he says that that day. Well, what day? Well, I believe what he's referring to is the day when the Holy Spirit of God comes upon them. And he says, at that day, ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. What? Ye in me, and I in you, and him and the Father, and all together. Uh, who here just got cross-eyed just a little bit? Okay, here, here's what Jesus is saying. She says, when he ascends up into heaven, hey, he and the Father, they're going to be unified. They're unified. He's going to sit on the right hand of the Father. Praise God. 
But listen, when a person puts their faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God comes and dwells in that believer. That believer and that spirit and the Holy Spirit of God are unified. And listen, and Jesus says, that's my spirit. That's the spirit of truth. And so therefore, the spirit of truth and the Lord Jesus, they're unified. So what's the idea here? The idea is this. When a person puts their faith in Christ, they're unified with the Holy Spirit of God. They're unified with the Son of God. And they're unified with the Father. There is unity when there, I, when there is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. And, and listen, I believe that we can see the value of what the Spirit brings. And so, listen, Jesus told them, if you love me, keep my commandments. But we've also concluded to keep his commandments is impossible for us. But wait a minute, Jesus, I'm going to give you someone to assist you. I'm going to give you someone who is able to help you. And I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit of God. And when the Spirit comes, listen, there's unification between you and the Spirit, you and the Father, and you and the Son. I think we have plenty of help to obey his commands. I think there's plenty of help. To obey the commands that Jesus gives us. But listen. To obey his commands. There's also a benefit. To obey his commands. Did you know that? Okay now you know. Listen. We don't serve a God who says. Keep my command so it benefits me. We don't serve a God like that. Listen. When we serve God. And we keep his commands. It benefits us. Okay. Keeping Christ's commands with the help of the Holy Spirit, it will do this. Make God's presence evident in your life. Okay, look at verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Jesus, he, he's telling his disciples is that, hey, if you, if you keep my commandments out of love, my father's going to love you and I'm going to love you. And not only is my father going to love you and I'm going to love you, but I will manifest myself to you. Now, what's that mean, manifest? Manifest means this, to reveal. Manifest means to open. Manifest means to, to uncover, to, to show for all to see. Now, the disciples, they were confused by that. Because there was one disciple named Judas, not Iscariot, not Judas Iscariot, not the betrayer. He already left to go to go betray the Lord Jesus. But there was another disciple there that he was confused and basically saying this. Lord, if you're going to leave, how are you going to manifest yourself to us? But yet the world's not going to see you. He's confused by that. And I can kind of understand his confusion there. But notice what Jesus says in verse number 23. Jesus answered and said unto him. If a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. You know what abode means? After church, you're going to go to your abode. You might go to lunch and then you might run some errands. But after services today, most likely all of us, we're going to go to where we abode, abide. Bad grammar, sorry. You know what that means? A place of habitation, a living place, a dwelling place. That's what abode means. And this is what Jesus, this, this is the idea of what Jesus is saying. If you keep my commandments motivated by love with the help of the Holy Spirit of God, then this is what's going to happen. My father and I, we are going to make ourselves manifest. We are going to reveal ourselves in your life. I'm going to reveal myself. My father is going to reveal himself in your life. In other words, he's saying this. You obey my commands out of being motivated by love. You will look less and less like you. And you'll resemble more and more like my father and I. That's the idea there. My, the presence of God will be evident in their lives. Hey, listen, I think each and every one of us desires to have the presence of God evident in every aspect of our lives. Listen, come on now. How, how many of us desire that, hey, I want my marriage to reflect the presence of God. I want my home life to reflect the presence of God. I, I want my church to reflect the presence of God. L listen, I, 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 want, uh, I want our community to reflect the presence of God. 
Cer- certainly we should. That, that certainly should be the, our desires. But listen, if, if, if we desire the presence of God to be evident in our lives, to be evident in our marriages, to be evident in our children, to be evident in our church, to be evident in our community, then this is what it requires, church family. It will require obedience. It will re- require obedience motivated by love. Yeah. And listen, here's the thing. We understand that we cannot keep the commands of the Lord Jesus Christ in our strength, in our own flesh. Cannot be done. But praise God, we have the Holy Spirit of God. Praise God for that. I mean, we already talked about how that the Holy Spirit is a huge benefit because there's unity between us, the Spirit, the Son, and the Father. Okay. But listen, the Holy Spirit of God will reveal truth. The Holy Spirit of God will lead you to truth. But listen, the Holy Spirit of God cannot and will not make you obey truth. Did you hear that? The Spirit will not make you obey truth. We already said this, love is a choice. Love is a choice. Love is choosing to obey His commandments by the help of the Holy Spirit of God. You know what the Holy Spirit of God will do? This is what the Holy Spirit of God will do. The Holy Spirit will say this. Hey, you, you, you know you're saved. You know you're born again. You know, the Holy Spirit of God, it will lead you to do this. Get in the word. The Holy Spirit of God will let you, lead you to get in the word. You know why? Because he leads you to truth. You know what's truth? The word is truth. But listen, the Holy Spirit of God will lead you to truth. The Holy Spirit of God will convict you and say, hey, you need to be in church more often. The Holy Spirit of God will lead you and help you and guide you to make those right decisions, but won't make you make those decisions. Everybody with me so far? Listen, he won't make you. Because God's still giving us a free will. God's still giving you a free will. And listen, what he wants you to do is this. If you love him, if you really love him, then this is what we'll do. We'll obey him. We'll obey his commands. Well, what are his commands? The word of God. The word of God. Listen, the more and more we get in the word of God, And the more and more we obey the word of God, this is the thing. God becomes more real to you. Did you know that? He becomes more real. Now listen, he's already real. And if there's any inclination of our mind that he's less real, well, that's on us. But what the truth of God's word does is that it reveals, he reveals on just how real he is. And listen, did you know that God wants to abide in your life? He wants to abide in your home. He wants to abide in your marriage. He wants to abide at your workplace. He wants to abide in every single aspect of your life. He wants to be real in every single aspect of your life. But listen, if he's going to be real in every aspect of your life, then this is what you must do. You must determine right now, Lord, I'm going to obey you. I can't do it on my own because I'm flesh and because I'm human and because I'm, I am weak. But by your grace and the Holy Spirit of God, help me to obey you, Lord, so that your presence will be real in my life. Listen. Husbands, you cannot be a good husband in your own strength. Did you know that? And many wives are thinking, hey amen. <laughs> no, no. Husbands, you can't be the man that God wants you to be in your own strength. Can't do it. Ladies, you can't be the helpmeet that God wants you to be in your own strength. So you know what you need? You need assistance. Men, we need assistance. Not just, uh, not just people's opinions. Not just other sources of other types of counsel. No, the main assistance that we need is a godly assistance. We need the help of the Holy Spirit of God. And when we, and when we uh, uh, allow the Holy Spirit of God to work in our lives and to reveal truth to us through his word, then we must choose to obey his truth, obey the truth of God's word, because we love Jesus. And if we do it out of love, motivated by love, then here's the thing. Then the presence of God will be evident in your marriage. And the presence of God will be evident in your life. You'll start looking different. You'll start acting different. You'll start walking different. You'll start talking different. You'll start being Almost like, oh, how do we say? A new creature. That's what will happen. This is what we must do. 
Love requires action. Love requires obedience. Love requires obeying his commands. Where are his commands? The word of God. Okay, so now church, now listen. I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you, okay? How many of you sometimes find it a struggle to not just make time, but to find time to get in the word? I'm not asking for a show of hands. But how many of you can just kind of relate? You know, it's, it's a struggle to get in the word of God. Sometimes it's hard to make time to get in the word of God. Sometimes it's difficult. You can go to bed the night before, and then all of a sudden, it's like you're going to purposely set your alarm clock, maybe 45 minutes, 30 minutes just before you have to be up, just so that you could spend time in God's word. And then all of a sudden, that alarm goes off, then you realize on how strong your flesh is. Don't act like you've never pushed the snooze. Stop it. You're in church. All of us in here knows what it's like to push the snooze. You realize on how strong your flesh is. You realize how, how, how carnal your flesh is because everything inside of you is saying, just go to bed. Everything inside of you is just saying, just stay in bed. Everything inside of you is saying, I can sacrifice 10 more minutes. Come on. I can sacrifice another 15 more minutes. I, I, I'm perfectly fine with that. Oh boy. Listen, all of us struggle. We all struggle with the flesh. We all struggle with getting in God's word. But, but listen, if we love him, if we love him, then we will make time for him. We are willing to do the things that we love. Are you with me? We're willing to make time for the things that we love. Do we love him? Because if we love him, we'll keep his commandments. So how are we doing with keeping his commandments? Well, Pastor Richard, I'm, I, think I'm not, I don't think I'm that bad. I mean, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't do the bad stuff. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't drink. I don't, I'm not abusive. I, I, don't, I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. I, uh, I haven't gone to jail this month. I don't do the bad things. Well, praise God, you don't. And that's part of obeying. But listen, part of obeying is also doing things that we should be doing, but we're not doing. How about this? Our efforts in telling other people about Christ, do they communicate that we love him or that we don't love him? Come on now. Let's do some soul searching here. Let's get down to the nitty gritty where the rubber meets the road. Does your soul winning efforts in telling other people about Christ and how they can have eternal life communicate that you love him or don't love him? Love for your neighbor. The Bible tells us we should love our neighbor as ourselves. Uh, well, who's your neighbor? Everyone. Everyone's your neighbor. Hey, 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 listen, listen. I love everybody here. I love everybody here, but there is that one person at work. There is that one guy. There, there is my boss. There is that one person. No, 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 no. I think we talked about it in Sunday school this morning. You, you know, our, our love for others isn't based on them. Our love for others is based on who we are in Christ. So, how are we doing with doing the things that we should be doing? How are we doing? Does, does our faithfulness to God's house communicate that we love him? Our faithfulness to his house. God's word says this, forsake not the assembling of ourselves. Forsake not the assembling of ourselves. Forsake not the assembling of ourselves. You know what forsaking means? Forsaking, listen, I know that there are people that wish they could be here today, but they physically cannot. I understand that there are people who wish they could be here today, but they, they cannot because of health issues. They cannot because their spouse is in trouble. They cannot because they're, they're, they're struggling with finance, or they're struggling health-wise, and they desire to be here, but they physically cannot be here. You know what forsaking means? Forsaking is doing this. I know it's the Lord's day. I know it's time to be in church. I know this evening at 6 o'clock the, the, the church family is going to assemble themselves together. I know that, but I'm going to go fishing. I know that. But my favorite sitcom is on on Sunday nights. We laugh. But how many Christians aren't here Sunday nights because of a television show? 
how many Christians aren't in church on Sunday nights? Now, I'm not just talking about this church. I'm talking about like-minded churches, Bible-believing churches. They're not here because they choose to just simply be home. They just choose. God's word tells us, forsake not the assembling of ourselves. That's a command. If you love me, keep my commandments. Listen, I'm not, this message was convicted in my heart when I'm studying it. I'm saying, Lord, do I love you like I claim I do? Do I love you? Because there's a very simple test. Do I obey you like I should? Do I obey your commands like I should? And Lord, if, Lord, please bring it to my mind. If there's an area in my life where I'm not, where I'm not obeying your commands like I should, bring it to my mind, Lord. Lord, I want to get that right. Because listen, our God is worthy of our highest admiration and love. He is worthy of our love. He is worthy of our sacrifice. The church family, I want the presence of God to be here. Listen, there might be people who come into Calvary Baptist Church and they might say, well, they're a bunch of weirdos. That may be. They're a bunch of weirdos, but you know what makes them weird? Boy, they like to preach out of that Bible a lot. You know what makes them weird? They like love each other all the time. You know what makes them weird? They like shake hands and, 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 and they're like cordial with one another and, and, and it's strange. And, and then the, the ladies there, they, 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 they look like ladies and, and the men, they, they look like men. And, and, and there's, there, there, there's something different about them. They're just weird there. It's not weird. That's the presence of God. You know what? If the world calls us weird, I don't want to be normal. Have you seen what's normal out there? I don't want to be normal. Hey, church, do we love him? Do you love him? Because if we love him, we're willing to keep his commandments by the help of the Holy Spirit of God. And when you obey his commandments, God's presence is more and more evident in every area of of your life. Yeah. Father, we love you. Father, thank you, dear God, for your word. And Lord, how